All right, third part, we're going to be talking about cell walls of prokaryotes. And this is finally a structure that's uh, essentially not optional. We find uh, cell walls in all, all cells. Let me hit the stop button there. All right, in this third part, we're going to be talking about our first structure, which is not optional. And we find cell walls in essentially all prokaryotic cells. Uh, there will be a couple of exceptions, but they're not going to be important at this part of the course. So from this point, we're going to be talking about things that we find in all cells. Cell walls are, are actually very simple in their nature. They're composed of a mo macromolecule called peptidoglycan, which I'll frequently abbreviate PG. Uh, it's the peptide part refers to amino acids. And the glycan part refers to sugars. The sugars are demonstrated right here. We can see these two sugar rings, N acetyl glucosamine, N acetyl muramic acid. You can see the structures, which may look somewhat familiar to you from uh, biology one. Uh, I don't want anybody to memorize the structure or even these names. It might be helpful to remember NAM and NAG as abbreviations. The NAM and NAG uh, sugars are linked over and over and over again. These two sugars that we see right here are repeated many hundreds of thousands and millions of times to make the single mo macromolecule called peptidoglycan. Uh, we can see this sort of illustrated right here with NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, and this wraps all the way around the bacterium and comes back in and begins NAM, NAG, wraps all the way around and around and around. The backbone of this uh, is the, these repeating two sugars, NAM and NAG. And the peptide part arises here because separate strands of the NAM, NAG uh, polysaccharide are linked together. They're cross-linked with these amino acids, these peptides, which cross-link this thread of NAM, NAG with this one. And the presence of this cross-link makes the NAM, NAG peptidoglycan macromolecule incredibly strong. And what cell walls do is they protect the cell. Okay, uh, there's actually two different types of cell walls that we'll speak about in this part of the course. So we'll break down into the gram-positive cell walls and the gram-negative cell walls that we'll see in the next slide. Uh, gram-positive bacteria have uh, a very thick layer of peptidoglycan that surrounds and protects that cell. Uh, underneath this thick layer of peptidoglycan, we can see the plasma or cellular membrane, which actually represents the inside of that cell. This thick layer of peptidoglycan it makes the cell very well protected from all sorts of things out in the environment. We'll talk about some of those things that this can help protect us from in just a few minutes. There's some other components that are found. You can see this lipotychoic acid that kind of penetrates through and helps to tether this thick layer of peptidoglycan down to the plasma membrane. But really, the most important thing in the cell wall is this extremely thick layer of peptidoglycan. Now, the opposite of gram-positive is a gram-negative cell wall. It's structurally very different from the gram-positive cell wall. We can see, again, there is a plasma membrane. And there is a layer of peptidoglycan. All right. The opposite of a gram-positive cell is the gram-negative cell wall. We can see it's very, very different in structure from the gram-positive cell wall. There's also a plasma membrane, which sits down here, and a relatively thin layer of peptidoglycan, which uh, sits on top of that plasma membrane. Uh, 
as you might guess, this thin layer of peptidoglycan, if the thick one is very good at protecting that cell from various kinds of physical stresses, having a thinner layer of peptidoglycan, not going to be protected as well as that gram-positive bacteria. But a gram-negative bacterium has something that the gram-positive does not, because outside of this thin layer of peptidoglycan, there is also an outer membrane. We'll see exactly what this looks like in the next slide. But it's another membrane, very much in structure, like this plasma membrane down here. This outer membrane sits outside of the thin layer of peptidoglycan, and it's going to offer a matter of protection that the in that the uh, gram positive does not have. Here's a blow-up cartoon of what that uh, gram negative cell wall is going to look like. Here's my cellular membrane on the inside, a thin layer of peptidoglycan outside of the plasma membrane, and an outer membrane out here, which you can see that there are phospholipids that very much resemble the uh, membranes, lipids that are found here in the cellular membrane, with some unique lipids. We can see these lipopolysaccharides, which extend out from the surface of this outer membrane. These become uh, important from the point of view of disease, because as we get into the process of disease in chapter 14, we're going to see that this guy right here, lipid A, has important effects on the body in the process of disease. Lipid A, the presence of lipid A is a bad thing to have in the human body huh? because this is part of the gram-negative cell wall, the gram-negative outer membrane. All gram-negative bacteria have this component. All gram-negative bacteria are going to have these important effects on the human body. Gram-positive bacteria, in contrast, are going to lack this lipid A and not have those effects. In this next section, we're going to be talking about structures that we find uh, beginning at the surface of the cell and moving inwards in the cell. Uh, the first of these is the uh, plasma membrane or cellular membrane, which serves a critical function in all cellular life. It acts as a barrier to uh, prevent the free movement of molecules in and out of the cell. It essentially allows a cell to be by its very function. Uh, let's look a little bit at some of the structure of the typical uh, membrane that's found in uh, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We can see it outlined here in this picture. It's uh, the classic uh, example of the uh, fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane or cellular membrane composed of uh, phospholipids that form a bilayer with hydrophobic regions pointing in and hydrophilic head groups that are on the outside of the exterior of the, the leaflet of the membrane. And floating inside the membrane are uh, integral membrane proteins that uh, serve a variety of functions uh, that help the, the, the membrane to carry out the function that it needs. Uh, as we said, the function of a membrane is to regulate permeability in the cell. It uh, it helps to keep uh, molecules that are um, ionic, charged, or hydrophilic, or large from moving in and outside of the cell easily. Uh, molecules that are uh, small and nonpolar are able to move freely in and out of the cell through the process of uh, free diffusion from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. An example of a small nonpolar molecule that's able to freely move across this membrane that serves uh, no barrier to it is molecular oxygen. It's used in cellular respiration. If there's a high level of oxygen outside the cell and low concentration of oxygen inside the cell, the oxygen just moves across the membrane and this is down. that are not uh, small nonpolar molecules, things that are ionic, polar, or large molecules uh, are unable to get into the membrane. They, they, they bounce off the surface of the membrane and, and are relegated to one side or the other. And molecules that are ionic or polar or large that need to get inside the cell need to utilize these integral glycoproteins in order to be able to enter in.
Uh, as we said, small nonpolar molecules are able to move from an area of, of high concentration to an area of low concentration simply by passing across the membrane. But uh, anything that uh, doesn't have that small nonpolar characteristic is going to have to utilize these integral membrane proteins as channels or pores. And so we can see that these molecules move through the interior of this integral membrane pore and move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. A small polar molecule that uses a channel like this, we say, moves into the cell through the process of facilitated diffusion. Uh, when we talk about the movement of one very, very important small polar molecule, and that is H2O, or water, very highly polar molecule, it moves through a channel much like this one from outside to inside of the membrane. And when we speak about the facilitated diffusion of water, we give this a special name and we refer to this specifically as osmosis. So the term osmosis means facilitated diffusion, but it, it speaks very, uh, very precisely about the movement of water uh, via this process. So let's look at a little animation which shows this process in a little bit more detail. With their hydrophobic cores and charged surfaces, cell membranes are very efficient at blocking passage of many molecules. Some molecules, such as water, dissolved oxygen, and simple alcohols, are able to pass through cell membranes freely by passive diffusion. However, charged molecules and large molecules cannot pass directly through cell membranes, and hydrophobic molecules tend to become stuck inside the hydrophobic interior of cell membranes. In order to allow these complex molecules to enter and exit the cell, organisms rely on two forms of membrane transport, passive transport and active transport. Passive transport occurs along an electrochemical gradient, it does not require the expenditure of energy in the form of ATP for transport. Active transport requires the expenditure of ATP in order to transport molecules across the membrane. Active transport and some forms of passive transport require the use of transport proteins, such as the integral protein seen here. Uh, well, the effects of water on cells becomes very, very important because as we, we just saw, water uh, pretty much freely is able to move in and out of the cell. It's not hugely hindered because of the presence of those aquaporins in the membrane. Uh, water can have very profound effects on cells. Uh, things like salts are actually very highly regulated uh, across membranes and salt molecules such as sodium and chloride ions are actively either put in or removed from cells. Uh, this can have an effect on a cell when a cell is moved from an environment where the concentration of salt out in the environment outside of the cell doesn't match the concentration of salt inside the cell. When these concentrations are matched between out and inside the cell. We refer to this as an isotonic condition and the salt doesn't move but the water does move freely back and forth in and out of the cell. When we move the cell to a more concentrated salt environment, a high salt environment, where the amount of salt out here is much higher than inside the cell, the salt doesn't move, but water rapidly leaves the cell going out into the environment in an effort to try to make the concentration of salt inside and outside equal to one another. Since the water is rapidly moving out, the volume of the cell begins to shrink down, and we refer to this condition as a hypertonic solution, and what we observe is cell shrinkage in that environment. Uh, in contrast, if we move to an area of very low salt, where the amount of salt outside the cell is much lower than inside the cell, water rapidly moves into the cell greatly, greatly increasing the volume of the cell. Uh, if it's a cell from, per, for instance, in the human body, the cell expands and expands until it finally lyses under the, under the effects of osmotic lysis. We refer to cell put into these conditions as being in a hypotonic 
this solution. Now here's where the structures that we talked about previously become very, very important. If we're talking about a cell with a cell wall, perhaps a bacterial cell with a peptidoglycan cell wall, that peptidoglycan cell wall prevents the cell from expanding until it lyses. And so we can see this bacterial cell, even though the water is moving into the cytoplasm of the cell, the cell isn't destroyed in this process because the peptidoglycan layer is able to protect it from this osmotic lysis. Uh, we recall that gram-positive cells have a much thicker layer of peptidoglycan than a gram-negative cell wall. And consequently, what this means is a gram-positive cell is going to be pr protected much better from osmotic lysis than a gram-negative cell will. Gram-negative cells are going to be somewhat more susceptible to breakage when we move them to an area of high or low salt. One place where the, these tonicity effects becomes critically important in the process of human disease is during the disease of cholera. Cholera is a disease which is acquired through the gastrointestinal tract by this organism up here, Vibrio cholerae. Vibrio cholerae produces a very potent toxin that affects the cells that line the intestinal tract. We can see a cross section of the human small intestine right here with the villi that line it. Uh, one of the jobs uh, of these villi inside the lumen of the intestine is to absorb nutrients and act to increase the surface area of the intestine in the process of nutrient absorption. What the cholera toxin does is it affects the cells that line the intestines right here. And we can see the toxin right here. It enters into the cell and has a number of effects inside this cell. Uh, affecting very metabolic pathways, but the end result of it is that the cells that line the intestines actively push out salt from the human body, from the tissues that line the intestines. The salt moves out, and this creates an area of high salt out here and low salt out here. Well, we remember from the previous slide what happens when a cell like this is put in an environment where the salt concentration is high out here and low in here, the water moves too. And water rapidly leaves the human body. Water is rapidly secreted from the cells that lie in the intestine into the lumen of the digestive tract where it gets passed through the, through the uh, body, through the feces. What happens in these patients is, is they very rapidly become dehydrated. And in fact, they become so severely dehydrated in extreme cases of cholera that uh, water cannot enter the body through uh, the through the mouth. They cannot drink enough water to keep themselves hydrated. The real only therapy that can be done in these severely uh, dehydrated patients is actually to put them onto intravenous fluids in order to keep their fluids, uh, their blood volumes up through uh, forcing the fluids into their bodies. All right, so uh, we talked about facilitated diffusion where uh, molecules move into the cells and out of the cells from areas of high concentration and low concentration. And although the channels are essential for the movement of those molecules across the membrane, they don't require any energy. If we want to move in a molecule from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, against the concentration gradient, that's going to require the input of energy, and we refer to these as active processes. We can see a couple of examples of uh, molecules that are, are transported into membranes, across membranes, via active processes. Uh, we're not going to care about these terms in here. Uniport, antiport, symport are not going to be important learning goals for this course. But we do want to remember, and we do want to pay attention, that every single one of these is going to require the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP with the release of energy. And it's that release of energy that is critical for the movement of that molecule into the cell. This enables a cell to come into an area where there may be a small amount of a molecule that may be very important for it. Let's say, for instance, glucose. And the cell can still bring the glucose into the cell. And it will allow it to, to acquire this essential nutrient, even in times when the nutrient out in the environment may be present in very small levels.